Hi, everybody. My name's Kirk Tusaw. Up until a couple years ago, I practiced law exclusively in the area of cannabis uh, policy and cannabis criminal defense. Uh, I've uh, since become the CEO of Great Gardener Farms, an aspiring uh, micro cultivator uh, and breeder of cannabis. I'm very thankful to have been asked to moderate this panel on breeding and genetics by the good folks at the summit. I hope everybody here is going to nation we have. We have three panelists today, uh, Micheline Gravel, Ryan Lee, and Anders Gonzalez da Silva. Uh, hopefully we're going to learn a whole bunch of stuff about breeding and genetics. The loose uh, sort of format of this talk is going to be to ask the audience to imagine themselves as an aspiring uh, micro cultivator or cultivator and breeder in the legal regulated market here in Canada. And what are you going to do about seed and breeding into that? We're going to take you through uh, the process from sort of start to finish. Um, but I'm hoping we also have a bit of a free for to start from one of these really excellent panelists. And I'm uh, proud to be on a virtual stage with uh, currently. I'm going to ask each of the panelists to give you a brief introduction to themselves and areas of expertise. And then we'll launch uh, right into the discussion. So why don't we start with you? Hi, everyone. My name is Micheline Gravel, and I'm a partner at the law firm of Breskin and Parr, LLP. So we're a Canadian firm that specializes in intellectual property, and I have a science background. So I have a bachelor's in biochemistry and a master's in immunology, and I'm both registered in the United States and Canada as a patent agent. And in terms of work in the cannabis space, I am the co-leader of our cannabis practice group here, and we assist uh, various clients in this space getting plant breeders' rights protection, as well as patents on, on new inventions in the cannabis area. And uh, I guess that, that's my involvement in the cannabis industry. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Micheline. And uh, we'll go over to you, Ryan. Hi there, folks. My name is Ryan Lee. I'm a founder of a company that operates in the Canadian cannabis space called Chemovar Corporation. Um, we do genetic imports from uh, various countries into Canada. We essentially broker and guide our clients through that process. Um, I've been working with cannabis for 30 years, um, work kind of all over the world in different uh different systems. Most recently, while well, previous to Canada, I was down in California. Um, working in the intellectual property development space, uh, breeding plants with unique and rare chemotypes. Uh, I've got a science background in neuroscience where I studied the endocannabinoid system and then kind of changed paths and went into plant breeding and biotechnology at University of British Columbia. So I come at uh, the cannabis breeding space from a, a university trained plant breeder perspective. And finally, Anders, tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Anders. I am um, the Chief uh, Bioinformatics Officer for Lighthouse Genomics. I'm um, relatively new to the cannabis industry, but I have uh, 10 years plus experience in uh, using genetics to um, help people make better decisions. Uh, either in the fisheries industry or in conservation biology or in public health, uh, and now sort of bringing my expertise to the cannabis industry. Um, you know, what we, what li at Lighthouse, we, we believe that you know, information is key uh, to help the cannabis health, to uh, improve cannabis health, diversity, breeding, consistency, and consumer safety. Uh, and we're you know, hoping to work with, uh, with breeders in order to assist them in their breeding. Uh, and also uh, working with um, uh, big market players in order to provide certification uh, so that there's confidence both from the consumer side and uh, from the producer side about what they're putting into the market. Well, uh, for being here today, uh, I know that uh, this is kind of a unique way of doing a panel. Normally, we'd all be on stage together. Um, so uh, I thank you for taking the time this morning, and I know the Growing Summit uh, is pleased to have your participation. So let's dive right in. Um, 
you'll recall uh, we are going to put ourselves in the position of a aspiring uh, want to be cultivator and uh, breeder in the cannabis space and um, one of the first things we want to do is figure out what genetic or genetics of cannabis we're going to use to form the basis for our business maybe you have some uh, in your possession already and you're going to use the genetics amnesty that's part of the regulatory scheme to bring them in or maybe you've got to go out and uh, use the services of someone uh, like Ryan Akimabar to bring genetics into the system uh, post-licensing. Either way, uh, obviously the choice of starting genetics is an absolutely critical uh, decision. Uh, and so we'll start with you, Ryan. Um, our farmer is going to start with an outdoor crop uh, and a small indoor area here in where I am in British Columbia. Uh, I'm wondering if they should be looking at auto flowers for the outdoor and I'm wondering whether your answer changes if the geography changes, if they're in Ontario, where you might have a, a slightly extended growing season because the rains don't necessarily start at the same time. Well, com coming from Ontario, that's true on a good year, but in a bad year, that's, you know, it can be just as wet and moldy in, in Ontario as it can be in British Columbia. Um, outdoor is a really challenging aspect in, of cannabis in Canada. It's, uh, I think cultivators really need to understand that we're not in California. You, you look up <laughs> in the sky, it's pretty obvious. Um, and cannabis has a, a bit of a strange pattern in the, in that it flowers in the fall. Um, and most of the drug varieties that exist on the, on the, in the planet didn't come from, let's say areas as far north as we are in Canada. So Canada really does present some unique challenges in terms of um, plant selection. With, with all things cannabis um, and, and to a new farmer opening a cannabis business, it's really important to understand that you, you want to make the choice of your genetics based on a kind of a whole systems approach of your philosophy and your, um, you know, your distribution partners. There's no point in just going out into the market and, and growing a bunch of seeds that nobody's going to want to buy. Um, so really having an understanding or even an agreement or an LOI with, with one of your, um, with, with a distribution partner is really key beforehand, before you even start the crop. Um, there's a lot of people that are, that are planting in Canada now and growing these crops and they don't have any idea of where the crop is going to go and no commitment from a purchaser. And, uh, you know, that's obviously a big risk to your business if you're putting in all this, these resources to go and grow a crop without knowing where it's going to go, given the massive supply glut that we have in Canada. The other thing that's really important to understand, I think currently, again, partially due to the supply glut, is that um, most crops that are going to be grown outside in Canada are not going to end up on the market as a solid flower. It's going to be turned into extracts. Uh, mainly just for THC distillate because Canada currently doesn't have the specific type of processing to produce higher value concentrate products like um, butane extraction or, you know, I guess rosin is starting to come online. But again, that's a little bit of a bottleneck in terms of the vast amount of biomass that we have currently under production in Canada. Um, so it's really important to understand that if, you know, if that's the case and you are just growing for a single chemical, something like an autoflowering plant really might be your best bet because you're guaranteed to have a crop in roughly 75 days after the seeds are planted, which means if you plant even in early June, you're going to be finished by uh, mid-August. Mid um, and that just allows you to, you know, that, that ensures that you're going to have a, a, a crop come in Whereas if you're growing a photo period plant that doesn't trigger until September or even finish flowering into October, you know, you, you certainly run the risk of losing the crop to uh, environmental conditions. Well, thank you. I know someone with about 6,000 plants of photo period variety sitting outside in British Columbia right now. I can only say that I only hope this summer extended by exactly as long as it seemed to be delayed by in June with the rains uh, so that we can get that crop in. Uh, Andrew, let's say our, our farmer has settled on a bit of a mix of genetics, because I think most people will. Um, some auto flowering uh, northern lights and some photo period uh, or traditional um, Afghani, which most people would say is a classic indica to the extent that you feel those terms have meaning. 
uh, and then am amnesia haze, which is uh, on the other side, I think it's sort of classic placebo. Um, or at least that's what the seed seller that you're buying from calls those genetics. How can or can our farmer be assured that the genetics they think they're getting actually match those um, pretty classic strains? Um, well, at the moment, I don't think there is much in the market that will allow them to actually know 100% for sure that what they are being sold is, in fact, what they're being sold. Um, I think that, there, as you alluded there, as you're asking the question, there seems there's still some, uh, there's a lot of folklore around the, the names uh, of the different uh, strains. Um, and a, a lot of people will call the same thing you know, that may look the same, but in fact, genetically are quite distinct, or they may look a bit different and genetically they're quite, um, quite similar. Um, and so different suppliers might be calling the same thing pink kush, but in fact, they might be different things. Um, so there, there seems to be very little at the moment, uh, good standards about defining these, these strains. Uh, so it's not like in poultry or in dogs where there's exact specifications to define a breed. Um, so, and in the cannabis, this, this evolution of so-called strain is, is, is distributed in, in kind of vague uh, consensus of what constitutes the strain. So what, you know, one of the things that we're, we're trying to do right now is do a little study where we're, we're purchasing uh, off the shelf uh, products that are called Pink Kush, and we're uh, doing the genetics behind it to try and demonstrate whether they are the same or different, uh, or different products. Um, and so we're trying to build this, the idea that there needs to be um, some better specification about what are the, the, diff the different uh, strains out there, in which we call genovars, uh, and that there, there has to be better um, accountability for what people uh, sell. Um, and in the, in the process, we're trying to build a, a registry um, of uh, cannabis strains um, that will be um, characterized by their genomics and about with the, uh, and their um, metabolites, so their, their phytochemical properties, uh, in order to provide certification as part of this uh, what's called the CAPS program, which is being led by Purity IQ out of uh, in Ontario. Um, and then, so hopefully, what that will do is provide. Um, Re reliable certification to to the the purchaser of their seeds to the purchaser uh, of, of the products that what they're actually buying is in fact um, what they're they think it is um, and that hopefully then there will be uh, some uh, and then what we hope to bring to this is to help these producers provide stability into the, in, in their uh, crops so that they are able to maintain uh, over time uh, their, uh, their IP of interest that they've developed. Uh, so once they, they start breeding and they you know, hone in on something that the, the market is really interested in, as Ryan was alluding, uh, you know, they're able to demonstrate that it's a, it's a stable crop um, and that it has some stable properties that they can uh, market and uh, put a, an IP around it that they can protect. Fascinating. And so let's say our farmer, um, uh, I guess it comes down to trust at that point. So you're trusting the source currently that they're going to be providing you with the seeds or, their, or the clones, and they are what they say they are. Um, Micheline, let's, let's ask you this question. Let's say our farmer's purchasing the seeds from a seed company, a European seed company. And, and importing them uh, into Canada. Uh, Afghani is a fairly generic term, but uh, amnesia haze and northern lights are, are classic strains that were bred by someone uh, way back, perhaps lost in the annals of time or not, but they certainly can be associated with a particular seed company or seed bank. Um, are there IP issues that our farmer needs to worry about here with, with trade names? 
Um, and what are those IP issues that you need to be considering really at the outset of your business? Yeah, so generally, though, if you're purchasing the seeds, you should have an implied license to use the seeds, to grow them and harvest the plants. But, you know, be careful, read the fine print of any agreement that you're entering into with the person uh, from which you're buying the seeds. Um, they may have other restrictions on it. So you have to make sure that uh, you're able to at least grow and uh, harvest the product. Um, you most likely won't be able to sell the seeds or reuse the seeds, especially if they have plant breeders rights protection in Canada. So IP rights are only relevant where you're doing business, where your activities are being conducted. So, you know, if they are from outside of Canada, but they, you know, you check to see if they have any rights in Canada, and I'll talk a little bit later about plant breeders' rights and what that entails. But I just think the bottom line is, you know, when in doubt, make sure you know what you're getting into. Read the fine print. Ask ask the seller um, if there's any restrictions imposed on what you can do with the seeds once you get them in Canada. Great. And let's assume our farmer has done that and, and know you can do whatever you want with these seeds. So they've got these auto flowering northern lights and then they've got what they believe to be a, a classic indica strain in terms of Afghani and a classic sativa strain in terms of amnesia haze. Uh, Ryan, do they have an indica and a sativa? Do those terms have any substance or meaning uh, these days, or are they sort of artificial distinctions? No, they really, they really don't. Unfortunately, um, the word, I, I, you know, I, I feel like I need to back up. The word strain also doesn't have any meaning. Um, in, in the plant world, it's kind of, uh, it's kind of silly that we use that word because it's, you know, the, the plant folks of the world, the folks that kind of oversee all the naming of plants and bacteria and all that kind of stuff don't use the word strain for plants. They use the word cultivar or the word variety. A cultivar is essentially what Anders is referring to as a, what do you call it? A genovar. And really that just yeah. means that it's a clonal plant that has been selected from a population of seed plants. Um, cannabis has a very uh, unusual breeding habit in the plant world. Um, it's called an obligate outcrosser. And so you might think of it more closely to breeding like humans than breeding like, for example, tomato. Um, if you take a tomato and it's not a hybrid tomato, you take a heirloom tomato seed that you've bought from the internet and you, har you grow the plant and you harvest the fruit and take the seeds out of it, the seeds for, the, for next year will produce the same type of plant um, that the parent, that the parent fruit produced. Cannabis isn't like that. Cannabis is, um, highly variable. You can think of it like, you know, a, a human family, mother, father, a couple of children, the children don't look exactly like the parent or either of the parents. And they don't look exactly like each other unless they're twins. Um, so in, in the plant, in the cannabis plant world, that means that they'll have different heights and yields and flower times and most importantly, different chemistries, different levels of THC, different terpenoid profiles, different terpene levels. And so what we do at Chemovar is we grow these, well, we, we also do the breeding, but we, we grow large populations of plants and we use a laboratory to select the most ideal plant for, in, in our estimation of the population. And then that plant is is licensed out to cultivators or is grown for flowers um breeding this type of crop really is a specialty it's not uh you know <laughs> think, think of it if you're if you're a lawyer you know if you're a lawyer and you're going into a big fight um in court you want to have a real lawyer breeding your you want to have a real lawyer that's defending your 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 case um, and plant breeding is kind of the same way. I would, I would argue it's the same way. I mean, I'm high, highly biased, but I would argue it's the same way in cannabis that, you know, you, you've spent hundreds of thousands of dollars or millions of dollars building your facility. You're running a, a business that ha potentially has, you know, at least hundreds of thousands of dollars of revenue a year, if not millions of dollars of revenue. And to base that kind of agricultural practice on genetics that are obtained from people that aren't tra trained in the art, um, to me is, it seems kind of silly. Um, so I, you know, I really suggest that people vet their seed, su seed suppliers or their genetic suppliers, ask as much as you can about the plants and what you can expect from them. You know, if you're growing from seed outdoors, um, that variation could well cause problems in your extraction process because you're going to have a very diverse terpenoid profile. You're not going to have 
or, or cannabinoid profile even, you're not going to have this exacting flavor type that the market really demands. Um, and and with, with regard to indica and sativa, I mean, those, those words were used to describe different types of plants. We use them, again, like strain, we use those words incorrectly. And it's really kind of like dividing, you know, imagine you had to divide wine up into the groups of, of different varieties of wine that we that people all know and love. And you could only describe them as red or white. It's really a failure of our ability to inform the consumer or the farmer what they're growing. Um, so I think that we need to shift to, um, the industry really needs to adopt these terms that are standard in all other plant varieties. Um, cannabis isn't special in, in that way. Um, and we've picked up a lot of bad habits along the way through prohibition and, and it's really time for everybody to up their game. Um, you know, cannabis makes a lot of seeds on her own in the wild cannabis grows. It produces tons and tons of seeds. We shouldn't be patting ourselves on the back and calling ourselves breeders because we make seeds. Uh, breeding is a, a a technology and a science as well as an art. And there's a set of heuristics and methods to apply in order to achieve a predetermined result. It's not just crossing a couple of plants willy nilly and saying that we created something. So with that sort of cautionary tale in mind, our, our aspiring farmer has obtained these seeds. Uh, they've grown out a test run. Um, of each. They don't necessarily love the outcome uh, of any of the individual cultivars, uh, but they do like some of the characteristics associated with the two photo period plants that they purchased, the, uh, what we are calling the Afghani and the Amnesia Haze. And so this, uh, this person has taken some advice, but is going to ignore uh, Ryan's advice to let the experts um, do the breeding and is going to do the breeding in house. Uh, and so they also want to go ahead and try to breed the autoflower with one of the photo period plants just to sort of see what happens and learn. Uh, Micheline, let's say our farmer's pretty confident. Maybe it's misplaced confidence, but maybe they're confident they're going to end up with some excellent and unique um, uh, characteristics in these different cultivars and the plants that uh, are the progeny of this breeding experiment. What should they be thinking about from an IP perspective as they begin their journey uh, into the world of breeding? Yeah, so if they do develop a unique variety, um, the first thing I think they would consider is applying for plant breeders rights. And that gives the owner of the right the ability to sell, produce, reproduce, import, export all the propagating material. So the seeds, the cuttings for 20 years. So it's a long period from the day the PBR, I'll just short form it, the plant breeders right, is granted. Now it may be premature. They might not have had enough generations of growth to show that it's, because uh, it, ha it has to be distinct, uniform and stable over successive generations. But it's something to start thinking about. And when you do go to apply for a PBR, you must do comparative uh, testing of your variety versus the closest variety. Often it's one of the parent plants just to show that you have new properties that are, are you know, distinct from the, from the other varieties, usually something that it's advantageous over other varieties. Um, so ev eventually when you're ready to apply, you're going to have to do some uh, growth, you know, two seasons generally of growth um, to show the comparison with the reference variety. So it's something you start thinking about as you're uh, going forward, um, just making sure sure that it is uh, distinct, uniform, and stable. Um, you may also start thinking about trademark protection if you're going to commercialize. Uh, now, it's a bit of a tricky area because trademarks are being allowed for cannabis. You can get a trademark at the trademark office, although a lot of them may contravene the Cannabis Act. Um, you know, there's very strict guidelines on how you can promote and advertise cannabis in Canada. You know, you can't use people or animals or use any words that make it look like it would be fun to use the cannabis. So anything that evokes glamour, fun, excitement, uh, those can't be used in the trademark. But still, it's nice to sort of coin out a name that you want to be used in a associated with. The name you use for the trademark will be different from your denomination at the PBR office. They can't be the same. 
at the Plant Breeders Rights Office, you have to use a generic term. Right? Often it's just a number. But those are things you start thinking about early on is, you know, if you think you're going to have something quite unique and special and that will be, you know, do well in the market, you might think about plant breeders' rights and possibly trademark uh, protection. I have a question and for so you. About... Oh, go ahead, Ryan. You mind? I've, I've got a question for you about reference plants. The cannabis industry has for the most part, been left out of the plant breeders' rights world because up, up until recently, the vast majority of companies didn't have licenses necessary to be able to engage with a legal system. Mm -hmm. And all of the cannabis, well, not all of the cannabis, but the vast majority of the cannabis that has been at least sold through European seed banks and Spanish seed banks and even Canadian seed banks don't have any intellectual property attached with them creating this vast, vast pool of plants that are essentially public domain intellectual property. It's not owned by anyone. Um, so how, how will the PBR folks deal with having that, you know, if, if there's no set of reference plants to which to compare, or at least licensed well, reference you, plants to which to compare, yes. how can people show that their, their plants are actually novel? Um, so that's it's been an area, and most people have been afraid of the PBR system for various reasons. One is actually saying out loud what I guess your reference variety is. You don't want anybody to know what the closest variety is, um, and you have to prove that by growing. But you have to compare it to reference, and you have to show it's it's distinct, it's different. Now, they, you're right. There's no way they can look all over the world to make sure that no other similar plant is out there. They, they're, they are constrained by the information that's provided to the PBR office. And... A lot of you know people have been afraid to use the system or reluctant. I'm going to say there's only been 10 cannabis varieties that have been applied for in the Plant Breeders Rights Office. Eight of the 10 we filed in our from from our firm, and and, and it is a big LP in Canada that did, that did apply for eight. Um, you know that that's public record, but I won't. I don't. I just don't want to name anybody right now. But yeah, there there has been some reluctance. But I still think that the PBR office can grant based on the reference variety. They're they're not going to do like in the patent world where they search, try to uncover, try to make you know make your invention not novel. Um, but in the PBR space, I think they're just looking at your comparative testing to see if what you have is different. Do you think and that makes it be, sorry? Do you think that makes it susceptible to challenges of your your PBR rights in the future? I, yes, absolutely. Any IP right is always susceptible to challenge, but it's val you know it's valid until proven otherwise. So it's still a good right to have. So I seems I, like maybe. I, sorry again, Kirk. I just wanted to make one quick point. It seems like maybe. For, it seems like maybe for a lot of these smaller um, producers that aren't really making a business out of, of breeding or genetics that perhaps maintaining that variety within house as a trade secret would be more appropriate. Yes, that's done as well. Um, you know, people just don't want to, but it depends. It depends what happens in the marketplace. People might want information that you end up giving away your trade secret anyways, especially if you've given away any seeds, you've given away the invention and you've lost your trade secret. Once it's out in the public domain, it's, the trade secret is lost. So harder to keep control of things that are alive because um, those things can easily be given away and propagated. I'm hearing as a sort of practical matter for our aspiring breeder, um, if you're not satisfied with the parents and you get a really unique child, don't throw away the parents because you're going to need them at some point if you really want to obtain these plant breeders right as your reference variety. It, you know, it doesn't have to be, but it typically is because that's the one of the closest. That would be a closer variety to, to the, the child would be the parent as opposed to using an aunt or an uncle. <laughs> right. Uh, Anders, let's throw it over to you. How can, um, how can uh, the genetic expression in these plants play into plant breeders rights or, or can it? Um, well, I suspect it would, it could play a, a significant role. Um, if you can demonstrate that genetically it is quite unique. Um, and I mean, our experience by looking at, uh, a wide variety of, 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 um, samples across Canada is that the genetic base um, of genetic diversity in, in, in Canadian crops is um, not that high 
compared to what you might see when you start importing, say, land races from Africa or India. You know, they're, they're, it's, it's quite constrained, and I guess it's because um, it had a fairly um, small base to start off with. That was part of the, the legal market, and then people just kind of traded, and, and they started you know, breeding together. So there's a lot of little, little combinations, but you know, it's limited. Um, so I don't see a lot of uniqueness uh, out there yet. Um, it would be interesting to see when people start actually breeding um, their their varieties and finding unique combinations that they can you know then um, propagate uh, in in a um, scientific fashion, as Ryan was alluding. So it, when you start with a, a formal breeding program, you know, with a with a, a practiced and, and trained breeder, you would probably start by describing. Uh, all your genetic variety. So, what is the, the, the genetic basis that you have, and describing the the different ph uh, phenotypes that you have. So, the uh, the flower types. You know, if it's autoflower, uh, or the amount of um, THC you might have in the different plants, uh, and how that might be associated to the underlying genetic variety. And then you might do you might pick specific characteristics that you're interested in because you have a market for it and you've done that market research and you might want to put those into a set of the same plant and demonstrate that you can propagate that. Um, and so part of what we are trying to bring to the market is that ability for cannabis to really bring in you know, the, the agricultural science of the 21st century that is applied to you know, wheat or strawberries or any of the other or tomatoes, as Ryan's saying, to cannabis so that we can actually have um, you know, demonstrable links to the genetics uh, for the, their, um, the, the, the traits of interest uh, and allow them then to put that into a, a plant and propagate that and show stability. Um, and then uh, use that as, as their, part of their evidence to support their claim for IP. Let's uh, let's return to our farmer on uh, her journey through um, the new breeding process. Uh, and one of the things I mentioned that this farmer wanted to do was breed a photo period plant with an autoflower plant. Uh, Ryan, are there particular considerations here that are unique to that type of cross as opposed to breeding two photo period plants together or two autoflowering plants together? There really are. Um, autoflowering is what we call a single single nuclear recessive trait, which means when you cross that trait with a photoperiod plant, for example, the autoness or the autoflowering um, trait disappears for a generation. Um, the other major challenge of uh, of working with autoflowering plants compared to photoperiod plants is usually we, when you're dealing with photoperiod plants, you'll grow a crop, you'll keep clones from all your you know candidate breeding plants. Um, in vegetative state while you you flower up the crop and do a uh, phenotypical or chemical analysis on the crop um, to find the plants that, are, that most suit your goal, whether it's high THC content or a specific terpenoid profile. Um, and then what we do after we've analyzed the plants in the laboratory, we go back to the, the um, vegetative plant that we're maintaining as a, you know, call it a mother plant, and then we can use the copies of that plant or clones of that plant for breeding experiments. In the auto world, we can't do that because the plant, you're really not able to take cuttings in the same way that you are a vegetative plant. Now, we have a, a partnership with a, a, a company that has developed a method for actually doing this in, uh, in vitro. Um, so we can actually maintain those plants that we choose. But for people that don't have that technology, you have to, again, apply a very specific set of heuristics and a breeding plan that is thought out by a breeder. You really, you really, you really have to be um, using solid plant breeding principles to try to maintain that one trait of autoflowering, but in the meantime, push the rest of the genome to represent uh, the plant that you, you know, for example, if you're trying to make a, an autoflowering version of a photo period plant, let's just call it cookies, for example, you're trying to make an auto cookies. And you, so you have an auto plant that is not cookies like at all, and you cross it to your cookies plant, and you might, you know, you say you screen through your F1 and F2 populations. Um, 
you have to be finding plants that have the auto trait, but also have the rest of the genome majorly from the cookies plant. So that the, the phenotype and the kenotype of the plant represent what we know as cookies. Um, and that's really an extra set of challenges that I think that most plant or cannabis seed making companies really don't have the expertise to be able to deal with. It's not difficult, but again, it's a, it's something that you have to learn through training um, and understanding the art of plant breeding. And it sure takes a lot of time. It sure takes a lot of time as well. So you've got to yeah. get down to those variations. And, I mean, well, if you're going to put the time in, you want, you want to do it right, right? We don't just, you know, if any product, it's, it's even in carpentry, you don't just go around banging things with a nail and try to end up with a table, right? You have to start with a plan um, and then work your plan to end up with the final result. And there's just like carpentry or, you know, any any skilled art, there's a process to it and there's a set of heuristics that you use to get there. And, and a set uh, of uh, tools. And if you have the, the right tools to do it, you can do it right. And, and part of what we're trying to... Uh, Lighthouse is to provide those tools to the to the breeders in the cannabis yeah. industry. You, you yeah, foreshadowed great. my question well, Anders, which is um, our farmer here has a, a bunch. They've, they've made these crosses. They have a bunch of seeds. Uh, they're going to grow those seeds out and see what the upland generation looks like. You know, normally what you would do is you'd observe the plants in the vegetative state. You'd observe the plants in the flowering state. You'd keep uh, cuttings from the vegetative state so that you could you know, maintain that particular cultivar or that particular plant's um, identity. And you sort of wait. You have to do these different generations and you have to sort of observe and see what everything's like. Is there a way to use genetic data to speed that process up? Can you take um, some sort of uh, sample from a 10-day-old plant and figure out for example, is it going to be tall and lanky? Is it going to be short and bushy? Is it going to be highly susceptible to um, powdery mildew or other um, negatives that you want sort of to stay away from your plants? Can you do that it's early? Possible. Yes, it's possible. And I mean, these are techniques that people have been using, for instance, in uh, hardwoods, uh, you know, crops, wood crops, uh, you know, pine and, and eucalyptus that might take, you know, few years to develop uh, and so they want to be able to very quickly screen things um, the the point is that what, what you need is a and I think what Ryan's been trying to stress is that you need a baseline so you need to understand how some of the ge ge genomics are associated with uh, the traits of interest um, and so we've been working with uh, with a couple of breeders now to develop uh, some of that understanding and with them, we've developed particular, we're in, in one case in specific, we're actually in the process of testing out a, a, a very targeted assay for one of the traits that they're interested in. Um, which, so we've got, identified a marker in the gene, uh, in the genome that's very closely associated to the, the trait of interest. And so now they've got you know, their, um, their F1 population, they can quickly screen uh, and identify which ones have that those markers. Um, uh, for the trait and then move that, select those for the, the next generation and therefore speed things up. Um, but there is a, a an initial process to build up that understanding about, well, what is the genetic uh, diversity they have to start off with in their population? What are the traits that they're interested in? And then we sort of work with them to develop the, the markers that they need in order to speed up their selection process and not have to uh, wait to see if that trait be expressed in an adult plant in order to decide which ones can go forward. Yeah, it's my, understanding. Go ahead, Ryan. It's, my, it's my understanding right now, and there's a bunch of genetic companies in the space kind of all doing the same thing, and I've had a new number of conversations with a few of them. Um, and it, it seems to me that we're really at the beginning. I, I think what Kirk's asking is, can we turn on a breeding program where we can contact the genetics company and say, you know, do we have the markers for, you know, like we can do CBD, but for example, CBG or CBDV or THCV or specific rare terpenoid profiles or, or really um, obscure traits having to do with flower structure or yield um, to discover the genetic markers for those traits. We have to have plants with those traits and we have to watch those traits uh, segregate in subsequent populations with other traits in order to yep. be able to 
understand that the genetic markers that we have are actually associated with a specific either genotype or phenotype. And that process is a, a long road of discovery before we get to the point where we can start growing plants from seed and, like you said, extracting the DNA curve for, you know, at a couple of weeks of age and then starting to make determinations of those plants based on that genetic information. We're just not quite at that point yet. Um, and no. it's a long road of discovery. And maybe Anderson can clear this up. But I, I, you know, from what I understand, that's a, to really do a deep dive into mapping lots of traits. That's a very expensive process. Uh, well, where it, it can be an expensive process, uh, and it's one that been, we've been working um, with particular breeders for particular traits of interest that they have in their population. And so we've developed those markers. There isn't a, like in other crops, there, there aren't a, um, a, a huge set of phenotypes already with uh, known markers that we can have assays developed specifically for. Um, so we are at the beginning of uh, developing this huge catalog of uh, specific markers associated with specific traits. Um, but we are trying to work with, with uh, specific breeders or with uh, groups of cooperative breeders if they want to spread the risk uh, in order to develop those, uh, those markers and we'll work with them in order to figure out ways of licensing them um, so that they could be just for them or they could be licensing it to other producers to use. Um, you know, right now, I think the best, I mean, there's a lot of uh, uh, some, I think that the the most widely known markers are, are for uh, sexing the plants, um, but you know, we are definitely building up some of that catalog and our, um, uh, we have a, a, a chip with 40,000 SNPs that we're typing up as many varieties as we can and trying to gather as much of the information of the phenotype as we can in order to, to provide that, uh, that service for the, uh, to the breeders uh, and sort of dilute some of that initial cost. But some, uh, the, there is going to be a, a sort of a high development cost at the start. And oftentimes this is d done uh, in, in many crops through um, uh, government led uh, enterprises. So we're trying to um, work with uh, NRC to develop uh, some, some more genomic resources and have some government funding in order to do that, in order to make it available to the, to the Canadian market. Um, but some of that uh, initial cost is going to have to come from 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 the breeders. That's just the the nature of it, and you know, we're trying to jumpstart it. Whereas you know, some, for some crops, it's been diluted over maybe a century already of understanding the genetics. Um, How much does it well, cost to get a a sex test done through your your company? When well, maybe just to help um, cultivators understand what that type of investment would look at if they're considering feminized versus regular seeds or dioecious seeds uh we don't we don't specifically have a, a sex test uh, that we're doing at the moment um but we we work with the the companies we right now we work in partnership with the breeders in order to find ways that uh you know either they if they want to keep the full ip then you know that the cost is larger if they want to share some of the, the ip we dilute the cost and, and take some of the brunt for the for the initial R and D, um, so right now I mean we're working with specific breeders for specific traits that they're interested in, uh, and um, uh, if you want to run a full, you know, a, a single uh, array on a single sample, it's probably we could probably bring it down I think to about uh, eighty Canadian. I don't want to say too much and without my CEO's approval on that one because uh, but it's own it's it, there's some negotiable uh, uh, ways that we can work with you to um, uh, make th make it work for you so by all means uh, reach out I'll put my lawyer hat back on for a second and say Anders comments are neither an offer nor an acceptance to anyone <laughs> uh, yes <laughs> your defense lawyer hat uh, <laughs> yeah, um, but the, the 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 beauty of it is that it it is uh, it's 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 you should think of it as, as an investment in your in your business, right? Yeah, you're you're trying to to 
to really put something into it. So you, as you said, Ryan, if you're going to invest all this money in this, in, in building up this this business, you know, why not do it right? Um, well, our farmer has invested a lot of money in their facility and isn't going to be traveling down the genetic pathway immediately. They're going to sort of engage in some traditional breeding practices and watch the plants, smell the plants, and touch and unfortunately, in the current regulated scheme, it's a little difficult to cure, dry, and smoke the plants as part of your selection process. Hopefully, Health Canada changes that soon or makes it easy to do soon uh, because it's an important part of the process. Um, you want to know what the effects are. You want to know how it tastes when you smoke it if you're growing for flour, for example. Um, but let's go to you, Ryan, as a, as a person who has bred uh, cannabis the traditional way, but with that sort of deep understanding of science. What are some of the key characters you're looking for in the progeny of a particular uh, cross? And do you work sort of backwards from harvest? Do you, do you sort of find the best, let's say we're growing for flower here, do you find the best flower and sort of work back? Or do you sort of cull as you go based, based on growth characteristics? Yeah, well, again, again, like you said, working in the system, it's tough. Um, <laughs> It really does present a lot of challenges, and I would argue actually that the system, that the way that the the cannabis, let, let me just let me just stop for a second and say, cannabis has always been bred by how the breeders have always chosen the plants, at least in the drug cannabis space, the breeders have always chosen the plants by how they make you feel, rather than looking at a lab report. Um, and in the Canadian system, you can't do that, right? You have to have, like Kirk said, you have to have a special license to actually consume the cannabis within your facility, which is Sorry, Health Canada, that's nonsense. You're going to be able to buy it after it hits the market. Why can't you consume it in your facility and just chalk it up to r and I mean, we're not talking about kilos and kilos of bud here. We're talking about, you know, a couple of joints off of a plant. Um, so it's really silly. And I would argue, actually, that this method of us having to be forced to turn to the laboratory has really put a focus on THC and breeding cannabis for plants that are high in THC. Um, and we, you know, that's, it, it's kind of akin to the alcohol space to say, right, like, for example, the, the British Columbia uh, LDB, the liquor distribution branch, they won't take cannabis that's less than 20% if, if you're from out of, uh, if you're a sailor from out of the, the province of British Columbia. So imagine that you, the liquor store did the same thing and said, we're going to, you know, you'd wipe out all the wine, you'd wipe out all the beer, and you'd only be left with these high octane spirits, which is really, you know, we, we end up losing a lot of the good things that come from cannabis. There's, you know, some of the, the nicer head spaces that you can get from, from consuming certain cannabis varieties, they exist in the eight to 15% THC level. Um, so limiting the market or pushing the market towards anything that's over 20% is really kind of counterproductive. And I think it actually works against the regulations. Um, that's more uh, than that flies in the face ahead. of, it sort of flies in the face of the last hundred years of, and, and still ongoing in some parts of the world, demonization of THC as this sort of dangerous molecule that could cause exactly. these potential harms. And yet our exactly. regulatory scheme pushes producers to produce the highest possible THC varieties because that's what's selling. Yeah, that's exactly right, Kirk. And, you know, we, some of the work I did in California was based on type 2 plants, which are uh, CBD plants. Or, sorry, they're plants with both THC and CBD in them. The, the given total cannabinoid production from cannabis is really maximums out about, call it 30 percent. Um, and roughly THC and CBD exist in, in roughly a one to one state in the vast majority of the populations. So. It, and, and there's also been some clinical evidence that maybe these type two varieties with a, what I'm calling a CBD buffer are actually, you know, safer air quotes in terms of um, exactly what you said. That, you know, there might be some some mental health consequences of always, you know, driving your your brain, driving your system with with these massive doses of THC all the time. Um, and so. Like you said, Kirk, for the regulations to create a situation which kind of flies in the face of the, you know, the the spirit behind the regulations, I think is silly. Um, in terms of the question that you, that you said about how do we do the selections, 
we really focus on there's there's two ways to look at plants from my perspective there's what i call growers plants and there's call, there's what i call smokers plants and often those two plants don't really mesh well with each other growers want to grow the biggest fastest most mold resistant plants so that they can have a large harvest and the smokers want to have the plants that give them the most desired effect and and the best flavor and often those two um those two goals or those two the emphasis of those two um, those two drives are really kind of at, at heads with each other. Um, so we kind of try to, to combine the best of both. You know, we're a service provider. Obviously, we provide genetics to, to licensed companies. Um, our, our job is to help their business in both creating a plant that is suitable for their production environment. It's resistant to molds and mildews, and it has a, a marketable, uh, it has a market appeal for the consumer. Um, so yeah, you, you you know you want to go through your crop and kill certain plants, um, especially you're growing outdoors. Say you got a 20 acre plot, you know, the breeder's goal is to be absolutely ruthless with plants and kill the ones that don't um, that don't meet your expectation or, or they don't meet your goal. But again, growing in a, a regulated environment where there's massive costs associated with security and testing and you know all the resources that go go into running a grow. You don't really want to just start ripping up plants and throwing them away. Um, because again, again, an outdoor field, maybe the only thing that you're going to get out of it is a THC oil. So if a plant doesn't meet your expectations in terms of a breeder, you go and kill the backup of the clone, but you still let that plant finish its life cycle because you want the flower mass for your, you know, for your bottom line. Um, so I, again, <laughs> We're still early days in this industry and legalization in Canada. The, the system has a lot of grown up to do. Um, a lot of the handcuffs that the government put on us early on in terms of security and security clearances and genetic imports and everything, you know, it's, it's all the way up and down the, the system. Um, Health Canada needs to grow up and, and start letting the industry safely mature, you know, and, uh, and not expect that everybody is just going to run you know, run roughshod over the, the intent of the, of the regulations. You're here. Well, let's say, um, our farmer has, uh, achieved, uh, um, what they set out to achieve. They found, uh, this, this incredible, uh, progeny of their, of their initial breeding experiment. It's, uh, it's a great effect, super cerebral, uh, which is what they were looking for. Some people aren't. It grows vigorously in vegetation. It finishes in seven weeks of flower with, you know, heavy resinous buds that aren't PM susceptible, aren't mold susceptible. Uh, this is just, this is the one. This is the one they've been looking for. Uh, they have it as a mother plant. Uh, they have it in clone. So they've got the genetic. They've got that cultivar. Uh, Micheline, what does our farmer do now to protect this unique genetic. Can they patent it? Should they apply for plant breeders rights? What's, what's the path forward because they've got something really, really special here. Yeah. So patenting and plant breeders rights aren't mutually exclusive. You can do both. Um, definitely if there's a, you know, a stable variety, you can do a PBR. And I think I've mentioned that enough. Patenting is a little more difficult in this space, especially if you're using traditional crossbreeding. Um, so a patent has to be something that's new, useful, inventive, but it has to be something that doesn't occur in nature. So this is where you get hung up with, uh, you know, with, with traditional crossbreeding. You have to prove that, uh, you know, that it's a brand new plant. Um, so, but in Canada, you can't plant patent plants themselves. They allow you to patent the seeds um, or methods of making. So if it's you know, typical crossbreeding, you can't get a patent on method of making because I, they say that's that's well known. Um, so what, where we're seeing people patenting is if you do some sort of genetic modification. So if you've done any genetic, you know, if you find the genes that work well and you modify those, upregulate, downregulate, um, those things are patentable, but just a new variety, it's very difficult um, to patent. But 
I always tell people, the growers, anybody doing any experimentation, just be aware of what you're doing. Like you may find other things, you know, ancillary to the plant itself that you can patent. You know, maybe when you're growing it, you you create some sort of additives for the soil, or maybe you have a new method of extracting, or you, you develop a machine along the way to help with harvesting. There's a lot of things outside of the plant that you may be able to patent, but difficult to patent plants that aren't genetically modified, at least in Canada these days. And when Can you I... say genetic modification in this context, you mean uh, genetic modification in a lab, not genetic modification right. through breeding methods. Yes, like, you know, uh, transforming the cells to add in a, a gene or downregulate a gene or add in an enzymes that can, you know, increase the production of cannabinoids in the plant. That sort of stuff we see all the time. A lot of modification that way, but just taking plants and crossing them and coming up with a nice variety that has a lot of nice properties um, difficult to patent then that's what we, where we apply the plant breeders rights there, there could be also... other things you could patent though methods of selection you know using the markers to for detection like there's a, other things outside of the plant but i was just speaking to the, the plant itself can i also jump in here and say um like, like micheline said Plants are not patentable in Canada, but we have something called a utility patent, which is typically where those genetic modifications fall under. You're not actually patenting the plant, you're patenting the use of a specific gene in that plant. And so it doesn't matter what the pl what plant it's in. If you move that gene across from corn to wheat or to rye, for example, or, or soybean, the fact that you've patented that one gene is actually what applies. Um, to the you know that gives the protection to all the different plants that are in it um, plant patents are michelle micheline may be able to correct me on this but i think they're really only recognized in the united states as the major market but also in australia respects plant patents in canada um, higher organisms are not allowed to be patented and that's why we use the system of plant breeders rights rights and one of the things that plant breeders rights allows is that when you you're given the commercial rights to the plant but the plant has to be made available to the rest of the breeding community um, and the idea behind that is that you know plants in nature are a, um, a human right or the access to these plants is a human right and so we don't want companies taking them and kind of locking them up in a lab and only releasing a couple of different things um, that you know the genetics are really for for everybody to use but if you do develop a superior plant, then you can actually get the commercial rights to that plant, like Micheline said, for 20 years. And But I just want to clarify, we can't patent higher life forms, including plants in Canada, but we do get claims to the plant cell. And if anybody makes and uses the plant cell, they're infringing, you know, sorry, if anybody has a plant that has the cell, this was a Supreme Court decision, you know, 16 years ago, the Percy Schmeiser versus Monsanto. He had the Roundup Ready canola that he was uh, growing and uh, infringing their patent. And, you know, his one of his defense was, well, you can't patent a plant. How could I be infringing that plant uh, uh, patent? But uh, they had patents on the cells and him using the plant was enough to infringe. get a patent on the cell but uh, you know typically unless it's genetically modified um, almost impossible in Canada the US has utility patents and also plant patents for for seed derived uh, seed propagated plants as well but I I thought that would be too much to get into today happy to uh, take it you know anybody can reach out to me for advice on these specifics uh, at a later time thank you Anders um let's say as part of the process, uh, our farmer didn't come to you early, but they've now got this sort of uh, plant that they consider to be quite unique and they want a sort of full genetic workup, whatever that might be. What is that and how does that assist them in understanding how they achieve the outcome they achieve and then perhaps protecting it going forward? <laughs> Uh, so I guess the full genetic makeup, we would probably work with them to uh, genotype the mother plant and any of the clones, uh, produce a genetic profile, compare that genetic profile to uh, others that we have in our database to demonstrate its uniqueness. Um, we would encourage them to register with the, the CAPS registry um, and uh, would allow them to also develop um, a 
uh, a chemical profile based on uh, a nuclear magnetic um, resonance, uh, NMR. And uh, that will sort of establish the, the uniqueness, I guess, of, of what they're what they're seeing in terms of their the genetics and, and the, uh, the metabolic um, profile and allow them to then um, um, ensure that uh, that is maintained stable over time uh, so that they have actually have a product um, and and the, the consistent product that they can commercialize to, to their customers and, and return customers will be satisfied that they're getting the same thing over time. Um, and then we can work with them if they're uh, further interested in understanding some of the uh, underlying uh, 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 elements of the, of the genetic makeup that are contributing to that um, uh, phenotype that they're seeing because they are interested in, in uh, splicing in uh, some other uh, genetics into it or because they're really interested in um, finding ways that they can defend their uh, uh, their genetic uh, um, composition. Uh, we can work with them to do the full sort of genome makeup of it and look at their uh, their uh, parental plants as well and understand which parts of that, that came down and uh, part of making part of the mix uh, and give them a whole basically workout about it, how they their their plant sits in, in the Canadian market context and in, in an international context as well because we're trying to bring in as much variety as we can from from African land races and Asian land races in order to really build a, a database of what's available out there uh, and that will allow them to really uh, hone in on what they, uh, what's unique about their variety and what, what's the combination that makes it really unique. And it, um, and it would also allow us to develop little uh, marker tests with them for that uniqueness um, and, and uh, bring that, the cost of that test down to say, you know, uh, we're, we're, we're hoping to bring it down to just a few dollars a plant uh, and something that they could do, um, work with them to do it in-house so that they can really just sort of harvest it and demonstrate that it's there. Um, and they could also go out and if they want purchase things off the shelf and make sure that they're not uh, um, uh, uh, being scooped by someone else or, um, or their genetics that they've protected is being used by someone else. Although through the registry, they'll be able to, uh, re the idea is to build the registry to have include as many as licensed producers as we can. Uh, and therefore they will have a pretty good idea of how unique uh, that genetic makeup is. Great. Well, our, our farmer, and we're, we're reaching the end of our uh, farmer's life cycle here, but they've got this unique uh, plant. They've got it only as a mother and clone, uh, but they don't want to hold it themselves. They want to get it out there in the world. They want other people to be able to grow this plant. And so their thought is, all right, we're going to make some seeds. Um, Ryan, what, what do they have to do to stabilize those traits within this cultivar so that when they sell these seeds, um, the people growing the seeds aren't going to be disappointed in comparing them back to uh, this wonderful mother plant that, uh, that uh, this farmer's come off with? <laughs> that, that kind of gets to the art that I was talking about. I mean, um, you know, I spent years in university studying these over, over a series of courses and plant genetics and plant breeding and biotechnology and reading dozens of genetics books and then also learning about the cannabis species. I don't think it's really something that we can put down into a couple of minutes. Um, but, yeah, just to say that there is a whole science behind it. Um, it's again, it's not impossible to learn. It's 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 quite it's quite simple information if you understand um basic biology and meiosis and how cells divide and how sex cells are made. Uh, you know, the same, same, same thing applies to pollen grains as it does to sperm cells or egg cells in humans um, or any, or any animal for that matter. Um, and, and just to get a book on that and kind of to, to learn about it and how to create true breeding plants. Um, one of the major problems in the cannabis species in the cannabis germ, germplasm pool or the gene pool has been that the way that cannabis growers have have bred cannabis for at least the last 50 years has been you know we take the plant that we have or that is the most ideal of the time 
and then something new comes along and it wins a cannabis cup or something like that. And so we cross that to our new plant, right? And then we end up with a new plant and another cup wins, the, another plant wins the cannabis cup next year. And so we again outcross it to another plant and, and we keep doing this. There's no effort to stabilize. There's no uh, effort to inbreed plants and make them uniform. Um, and that creates a situation where, again, compounding with cannabis is obligate outcrossing nature, which already has this massive amount of genetic variation within between, between individuals. We've now created essentially a, a bit of a genetic stew um, that's really, you know, it's, it's all over the place. It's what we call poly, it, essentially cannabis is hybrids and hybrids of polyhybrids. And that leads to a complete lack of uniformity. Um, and, and breeding that kind of thing into something like Micheline said, that will pass the dust test, which will be, you know, the, the plant breeders rights people will declare, yes, this is distinct, uniform and stable is actually a lot of work. Um, and it, it'll take years. Right. And, and the truth is, is that, you know, maybe one out of 10 breeding experiments or less is actually successful. We can increase those. Uh, the chances of, of having success by using tools like Anders has been talking about. But um, really, it's a pretty wide art where you have to, you know, you, you make a lot of attempts and you make a lot of failures. And, and that's part of selecting really truly the most elite or the most ideal plants. Um, and, it, and it takes, like you said, Kirk, it takes a lot of time. It's not, this is, this is not get rich quick. This is not um, instant success. Everything I touch turns to gold kind of thing. I mean, it really is wading through the mud and, and fighting with the germplasm to find those few plants that are truly, truly superior. Yeah. Um, I mean, I'll just add to that, to that, you know, you would have that there's what the, I guess the technical term that Ryan is referring to is heterozygosity or so, so the number, uh, so like, like humans, cannabis has, uh, two sets of chromosomes, one from the parent, one from the mother, one set from the mother, one from the set from the father. Um, and uh, at the same position in the genome, they might be slightly different. Um, and so you get this diversity within the genome. And what we're trying, what would, what a lot of the, uh, you know, commercial crops that exist out there is that they've been sort of slowly inbred to the point where you create these inbred lines that uh, basically yeah, they're all every every position in the chromosome uh, in the two chromosomes are the same, uh, exactly the same. But because it's been outcrossed for so long, uh, there's a lot of little things that are hidden in the genome that are what we would call deleterious. So when you start to do the inbreeding, you get a lot of things that just don't survive very well. Uh, and you have to go through that process of basically purging that what we call genetic load uh, out of the germplasm to generate viable sort of inbred lines. Um, and hopefully uh, with the, some of the genomics that we, we have, we can then you know, generate those inbred lines. And then you would have basically a pure line that's sort of autoflower and consistently produces autoflower. And then a pure line that is sp with a specific CBD uh, uh, profile that you're interested in, and then you'd be able to sort of cross those two to introgress those two different uh, characteristics together and produce a, this inbred uh, clone without those characteristics. Well, having popped thousands of uh, seeds of both other people's genetics and our own genetics, uh, I certainly can attest to the fact that if you are looking at a couple of uh, recent cup winners that have been crossed together, uh, and, and you get them a year later, there's a, there's a strong likelihood that you're going to have significant variability within your seed population. Uh, doesn't mean you're not going to find a gem. Uh, it's just unlikely to be exactly like the one you thought it was. And, and that can be fine, too, depending on, you know, your time and, and what you're trying to achieve in your own particular grow. Let's, uh, let's wrap up. Um, with this last question, you, Micheline, and then we'll have a, a bit of a, a conclusion. But uh, let's say our farmers put the time in. They've gone to Anders. They've gotten genetic workups. They've uh, inbred their lines. They've crossed it to the, itself. They've crossed it to its cousins and aunts and uncles. They've stabilized uh, to the point where they're fairly confident that when they pop 10,000 of these seeds, 
uh, they're getting a lot of stability in the traits that they feel to be unique and, and what their consumers and their customers might want. Um, they put the seeds out into the marketplace uh, for anyone to buy. Uh, have they lost their IP protection? Uh, if somebody buys those seeds, can they, can they breed with them? Can they grow them? Can they call them something different? And uh, now all of a sudden you don't have any rights left in that genetic. No, um, if selling the seeds won't impact your IP protection, um, provided the timing is right. So in Canada, you have to file for a PBR application within one year of your first sale. Most people file for a PBR before they start selling, but if you have sold it and you're finding it, it is a good market, you still have a year to, to apply for a plant breeder's right. If you've sold outside of Canada, you actually have four years to apply. So as long as the timing's right, no. Um, and if someone buys it from you and you do have a plant breeder's right, um, they, they, you know, they can typically grow the seeds and, and harvest them, but they can't sell the seeds or sell the, sell the, uh, or use the seeds to replant. That would be contravening the plant breeder's right. Um, but there are three allowed exceptions if you do have a plant breeder's right. So um, people are allowed to use the seeds for private non-commercial activities. That's permitted. They can use the seeds to breed and develop new varieties. So they can take your seed that you have rights on and cross it with something else, come up with a new variety and get a PBR on the new variety. Um, so they're allowed to use your seeds for experimentation and to develop even better variety. And uh, farmers, there's farmer's privilege uh, that farmers are allowed to save and plant the seeds uh, on their own land. So those are three exceptions. Gotcha. Um, well, look, I wanna uh, conclude uh, in this way. I'd like to give everybody a last opportunity to sort of um, tell our audience what you think the one or two takeaways from this talk uh, ought to be uh, from the things that you've provided. I'll start by saying um, internal experimentation is fun, but we have on this panel three people that provide expertise in, uh, in these areas, whether it's protecting the IP, understanding the genome, or obtaining sourcing uh, and understanding the genetics. And um, you know what I'd like, what I, what I've sort of always told people, you know, I practice law. Uh, people would come to me and ask me about their family law matters. Uh, my answer would always be, you should talk to a family lawyer, not me, because I don't, I don't actually know anything about this topic. And so uh, it's best if you go and get expertise from people that have developed it over uh, many uh, years of either training or practical experience, uh, because that's the way to avoid some of the pitfalls that you may not even know exist. And so what I've taken away from this panel is uh, there's a lot of people out there with deep knowledge and go use their services if you have the ability to do so. Uh, what's your takeaway from the panel uh, today, Mission? Um, you know, just as I was saying, whenever you're doing any kind of experimentation, whether it's plant breeding, um, extraction, just be cognizant that there are possible IP rights that you can obtain. And if you do have IP rights, such as PBRs, I've talked a lot about patents, even trademarks, they can give you a monopoly in the marketplace, which can uh, help make your, uh, your, new, your new variety a commercial success. So just be cognizant when you're breeding of things that you may see. And again, it may not be the plant itself, it could be something peripheral to that, but just be aware that there are types of intellectual property rights that you can obtain to protect what you're doing. How about you, That's Ryan? It. Thank you. What's, what, a, what a say? I mean, there's so much that you could talk about. Uh, I think yeah. really it's important for people to understand, like you said, Kirk, you can play around at home. You can make crosses. You can actually even find plants that are ideal for your production environment and that really suit your business goals. Um, but you don't have to. That plant might not necessarily be a good breeding plant. It might not be a breed, good breeding candidate. Um, so I, I'm all for people breeding cannabis and breeding all plants and making all plants better. There's a, there's a lot of work to do about that. Um, it's, it's one way to really enhance society and enhance, you know, leave a legacy, leave, uh, leave the world a better place than you found it, so to speak. But I, I really encourage people, if you're going to endeavor to do that, um, that you should invest some time in learning how to do it right, because it'll make your, your work much more effective. It'll, 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 you'll be a better, um, you'll be, you'll be more easily, you'll be more able to reach your outcome. Um, if you're 
if you have an understanding of how the process works. You know, being a breeder is not you don't graduate from a, a grower to be a breeder just because you've hit a certain stage in your career. It really is a different set of skills. And uh, I encourage anybody to get into it and just take the time and learn about it and arm yourself with some knowledge so that you can, uh, you can go about doing it the right way. Over to you, Anders. Uh, I think I, you know, I'd like people to take away is there's, I mean, these are exciting times in, in the cannabis industry where we're trying to uh, bring some, uh, some hard science to it to really enable uh, cannabis to go to the next level uh, and you know, allow us to really explore. I mean, this plant, which you know, holds over 400 different chemicals with all sorts of different potentials uh, for, to, to, from, from medicinal to recreational and all sorts of things in between. And if we can, uh, you know, agree, uh, uh, bring some good hard science to it, there's, a, there's a amazing things that I think we can do here. So, um, yeah, I'll, I'll echo Ryan's and go ahead, breed, make some, you know, but uh, search out for some good expertise to help you along the way. And that will um, certainly bring, uh, much larger returns to your investment and probably and much better products for, for the consumers, I think. Fantastic. Well, look, I want to say uh, in conclusion, thanks to all of you for taking the time to appear on this panel. I think it's been uh, productive. Uh, we haven't been shooed off stage yet by the next panelists <laughs> that come in. So that's uh, quite um, although I think we didn't necessarily go much longer than we were supposed to. So I appreciate the information that you've all delivered. Uh, I appreciate the Growing Summit for putting on uh, this event uh, in these challenging times. Uh, I appreciate the audience uh, that's tuned in to listen to what we have to say. Um, stay safe, be smart, be good to each other out there. Uh, and thanks uh, on behalf of myself, the panelists and the Growing Summit, thanks for tuning in. Uh, and we hope you enjoy the rest of the wonderful presentations. <laughs>